Today, the focus remains on the tense situation in Afghanistan. August 31st, Tuesday, is the deadline for America to complete its evacuation mission. After that, anything could happen next, truly anything. In the United States, pressures on the White House to extend that deadline or thousands of Americans and Afghan allies will be abandoned behind enemy lines. Meanwhile, the Taliban has promised unnamed consequences if troop withdrawal isn't complete. It's hard not to see this as a lose-lose calculation. Then beyond that, what does life look like for regular Afghans after an entire generation of relative freedom? Many are terrified particularly women and girls. The Taliban is calling the fear unfounded hysteria and promises not to be the brutal regime it was 20 years ago. It also says it wants good international and diplomatic economic relations, including with the United States. We don't have a crystal ball, of course, but we do have someone who has a very good read on the region. With us now from Uzbekistan is Holly McKay, who recently made it out of Afghanistan. Holly, you've worked on the front line in war zones and humanitarian crises, not only in Afghanistan, but all over that region, Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Iran, Turkey, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, also Burma, Russia, East Africa. So thank you so much for joining us today. I know there's a lot going on for you. Yeah, it's, a, it's been a crazy whirlwind, that's for sure. A lot different to how I was initially anticipating this Afghanistan trip to be. I, I can only imagine. I'm very, very grateful that you're safe. Um, I just don't even know what it must be like to have been living through what you've been through. I can imagine, and, you know, everyone around you, a lot of panic, chaos, fear, and so much uncertainty. You were in the north, and Mazar uh, quite far from Kabul. So very fortunately, you made it out of, of Afghanistan into Uzbekistan uh, just a few days ago. Can you tell us what happened over those last few days and how you got out? Absolutely. So basically, my photographer, Jake Simkin, and I were working in Kabul. We really thought we would be in the region for several months, covering, I guess, that last chapter of when the U.S. left and, and, uh, and how the government was going to stand on its two feet. But... Uh, the story turned out to be very different. We went north to Mazar, where there was a, a lot of action because a lot of the northern provinces at that point were falling fairly fast. We really thought Mazar was, it was such a strong anti-Taliban place that it didn't seem like it was going to be falling anytime soon. And, and we were out in the markets doing interviews and the streets were, were really quite alive despite the situation. And it just deteriorated so rapidly. It sort of one minute, uh, everybody was out and, and things were just wonderful. The next minute, you just started to feel like something was very, very wrong. And you saw people lining up around the banks, trying to get money out. And just a, just this spidey sense that we both had. And as we were kind of running back to our hotel just because things felt so off and so quiet, that's when the Taliban were able to come in on motorcycles and really take the city without a shot. And it just... The speed of it was quite dizzying, and there was no no way we could have gotten out before that. So it was just a very uncertain time at that point. Uh, we were a little unsure, really, what to expect. Um, were the you know were foreigners going to be targeted? Were journalists going to be targeted? It just wasn't clear completely in the beginning, and it was a very uncertain time because there were no other foreigners around, and the airport had been closed, and we weren't sure you know any any road we would have taken would have entailed going through multiple Taliban checkpoints. So in the end, really the only viable option was taking the risk in having the Taliban uh, physically escort us and, and obtaining the permissions from the Uzbek uh, consulate in Mazar and, and going with the Taliban through those checkpoints uh, through to the north. That just seemed the only logical way out of the city at that point. Um, and for in my situation, it was obviously a risk with a reward that the Taliban were we trying to be very welcoming to me at the time and, and sort of trying to say that they weren't the Taliban that existed 20 years ago. So it was a very interesting experience, to say the least. And I you know, tried to get the best understanding I could in that period of time of what it is that they were trying to project and, and really who they were. Um, and so it was, yeah, it was a very interesting experience, to say the least. And I'm curious to see really what's going to happen once the United States does leave and, and flies that final plane out. And will this Taliban be any different to what it was 20 years ago? 
That's certainly the question on everyone's mind. I'm absolutely certain everyone who's uh, in Afghanistan and has no way out. So let me ask you, I know um, I read one of your pieces um, about a friend who is a women's rights activist. She's determined to stay there. Have you talked to her again recently? Is this still her plan? What kind of space do you think there is for someone like her? And just to, you know, sort of outline things, for a whole generation, women have been able to go to school, become doctors, lawyers, and, of course, the fear that that's all going to get shut down again. Absolutely, and it's a very genuine fear. And someone like Faria, I've known for many years, and she's been such a, a force of nature and really just fighting for women all across the country. You know, and, and it's... Uh, Afghanistan has, has been, especially in the rural areas, the levels of domestic violence are just extremely high, and she's been that person championing uh, for prosecutions to happen, for women, even those that have been murdered, to, to make sure that these people are not able to just get away and the, and the impunity exists. So she's been wonderful, and she's absolutely heartbroken and really rightfully angry about what's happened. And, and she feels very much like the entire international community, and not just the United States, but the United Nations and Europe and, and everyone else that sort of championed uh, the work she's done has basically left her to the wolves. And so she's been pretty much, aside from protesting a little bit in the street, uh, really hiding out. She She's trying to, trying to really just put together in her mind uh, what the next chapter of her fight looks like. But she's very determined that she won't be, she doesn't want to leave and she needs to be there to continue to continue this fight. And I mean, God bless her, the, the, what she's going to face is certainly going to be an uphill battle. But I don't think she's alone. I think that over the years that, that so many Afghan women who have become so accustomed to being able to live the lives that they want to live and to be the people they want to be and to get the educations that they want to get. And and they fought so hard for that. They are not willing to just let that let that go in the, in the blink of an eye. And they're re really willing to put their lives in the line. And, and to me, that's just absolutely extraordinary. I was going to ask about that, if there's, you know, networks of women that she's with that are also, you know, as determined as she is at this point. Absolutely. There are many. And I know in her case, she has three other sisters, and they're all very much um, as committed to, to the women's rights as, as she is. And so they have a, quite a contingency uh, across the across the Kabul and, and in some of the other cities. It's a little bit more difficult in rural areas. I think they're a lot more closed and conservative. But certainly in the cities, uh, there's just been a huge push in cinema and music and art. And, and life has really opened up. And I think women, the situation for women and the situation for media have been two of the sort of slim success stories out of the 20-year war. Whether you agreed with the war or you didn't, they are two things that have come out of it uh, that have been quite extraordinary in terms of the freedoms that have been issued. And the people that have fought for that, they're just not willing to walk away from it. And I think that, you know, we need to get behind that as much as we can in supporting them to stay. Mind you, most people have opted to leave. You know, most of the activists that I've come to know over the years in different capacities aren't willing to take that risk to wait around because they know that that could potentially be quite fatal. So people have really flocked and, and done their best to try to get out of the country. But for those that are staying, I just think it's an absolutely remarkable fight that they're willing to, um, to, willing to face the Taliban and they're not going to let these rights just go by the wayside. Be sure to watch the entire episode, now available exclusively at EpochTV.com, a new completely censorship-free premium subscription platform. Brought to you by the Epoch Times. See you there.